What we've heard so often in Baltimore, in New York, in all of these protests is the same rallying cry, Black Lives Matter. The message behind that, so many in the black community feel that the police in their neighborhoods and the justice system as a whole treat them like their lives don't matter. It's a message about bias, and whether it's conscious or subconscious, it's hurting people. We've done a lot of reporting on this issue over the years, including a study that showed that bias is not only very real, it starts way younger than you might think. Take a look. Show me the bad child. Why is he the bad child? Because he is black. What you're watching is a study examining the roots of bias. Show me the dumb child. Dumb child. <laughs> okay, why is she the dumb child? Because she has black skin. Show me the child who has the skin color most adults like. And show me the child who has the skin color most adults don't like. 360 commissioned a renowned child psychologist to ask more than 130 children from all over the country questions about race. Our study is based on the famous doll test of the 1940s, which showed the racial bias children develop from segregation, some of which still exists today. In the study, children of all races, even as young as four years old, seemingly picked up on the racial biases of society and all the ugliness that can sometimes come with that. What happens to these racial attitudes as children grow up? Are they still conclusively or subconsciously part of our adult lives? Spokane Police! Police Department! Hey! Hey! Talk to me! Talk to me! Wait, let go over! Hey! Let me see! New research, partly funded by the Department of Justice, is now studying bias in police officers and how they react to light-skinned suspects versus dark-skinned. At this lab in Spokane, Washington, officers undergo a simulation. Their brain waves and heart rates are monitored to see how they react during confrontations like this one. You receive a call from a person who says a convenience store is being robbed. Do you understand? Yes. Stand by. Hey! Hey! Back up! Back up! Back up! Put your hands up! Put your hands up! Drop the knife right now! Drop it! The suspect in this scenario is white, but do officers react differently if the suspect is black? The study found officers do tend to see black suspects as more threatening than white suspects, but they're more restrained in shooting black suspects, perhaps subconsciously overcompensating because of that bias. Well, joining me now are CNN political commentator and New York Times columnist Charles Blow, former NYPD officer Dan Bongino, Camden County, New Jersey, police chief Scott Thompson, is the chief uh, Eric Adams referenced in our last segment as the chief is doing uh, the right thing with his police force. And with us again is Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's uh, mother. Chief, thanks very much for being with us. Do you believe implicit bias is an issue, and how do you see it playing out? Well, it, it is. So we all have biases. Every human being has biases. And the first step is to acknowledge that and to best assess how that's factoring into decision making. What we have found is there's very, very strong study that shows that the stereotypes that end up creating a lot of these biases, the, the best remedy to start to mitigate those that affects implicit biases, which will ultimately uh, cause officers to act in a certain way, is to create and enhance the experiences with people that live in those communities. So that's what you've tried to do in Camden? What we did was we essentially put all of our officers out in footbe patrols for 10 and 12 hour shifts. And by the officers getting to know the people by name and the people able to get the officers by name, what we have seen in a community that's 96% minority and had crime rates that were rivaling that of third world countries, we were in, in less than 24 months be able to cut our, our shootings and our murders in half. Dan, I want to read you this uh, study back in 2000 by the J Department of, uh, of Justice, and it highlights a discrepancy between the way white police officers and African-American police officers view things. According to this study, 57% of African-American officers thought African-Americans and other minorities were given unequal treatment by police, but only 5% of white officers thought African-Americans were given unequal treatment. It's a pretty huge discrepancy. Well, I don't think any rational person can doubt the fact that the black experience with policing in America has been far different. But the question is, what are the remedies? I think on the, on the training side and on the community policing side, those are some incredible options, which I strongly agree with. Me having been white and having policed the 7-5 precinct in East New York, Brooklyn, which was maybe 90% plus black, 
I, I was I had never lived in a primarily black area. It was very helpful for me to walk a beat 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning and get to know who the social influencers are in the neighborhood. But we also have to worry about the, the reactive side as well. And I don't think we should jump to conclusions on, on uh, whenever we see a use of force incident that there's necessarily a racial component. Because I think what happens is you see that defense mechanism with police officers where all of a sudden they feel like even if it wasn't a racial incident, that am I going to be judged because there's a racial uh, discrepancy here? I may be white or I may be black and the officer may be white. Charles, do you agree with the chief who says one way to start to overcome bias is to have more contact, whether it's more contact between officers right. and the community, more contact. I mean, the more you learn about other people, the more time you exactly. spend with people who are different, the more perhaps your eyes are open. Right. What the police chief is saying is that they are basically doing this experiment in real time on the ground and they're seeing results. And that is good, but that's not necessarily the scientific data that we need as a country to adopt so that all police forces, no matter where they are, can adopt best practices based on science. We simply do not have that data. And that is, we should all look at that and say, this is, this is incredible that we don't have this sort of data. It is incredible that, that the, the data, the best data we have is from the FBI, and that's voluntary reporting. It's interesting to me, though, and it's something that parents, I think, can play a role in with their kids, is the parents that I interviewed for that, that doll study that we did, they were stunned to see their four- and five-year-old child when asked, who's the good child, without any prompting, any explanation of, you know, why one would be good and one not, going toward pointing, you know, to the white child as the good child, the, the, the darker-skinned child as the problem child. We saw that over and over again, even among African-American right. kids having this implicit bias. The parents were stunned, and a lot of them started to feel like, a lot of them had said previously, well, I don't need to have a conversation with my child about this because my child doesn't see race. Right. The largest study about this, which is, was developed by researchers at Harvard, is maintained by researchers at the University of Virginia, has found that everybody except black people have a, an enormous anti-black, pro-white subconscious bias. Secondly, though, uh, I think even more importantly, is that a third of all black people have a anti-black, pro-white Bias. The idea that we are not all submerged in the same poison of perceptions is, is, I think, a misconception. We believe that if somebody looks like me, I cannot possibly have a bias against that person, which is absolutely not scientifically true. You know, Sabrina, one of the things Charles and I have talked to a lot over the years, and, and particularly in the wake of your son's, your son's killing, was the conversations parents have with their kids. Was, was that something you had had with Trayvon Martin, with, with, with Trayvon, about how to interact with police? Is that a conversation you now encourage other parents to have with their kids? What I think um, is happening is now our young people, our teenagers, are seeing more of them being killed. And so they want to know how they can prevent it. You know, we have our young people now that's afraid to walk down the street or play their music too loud or different things like that. So I think it's an important conversation to have with your child because now you have a lot of parents, a lot of families that are trying to hold on to their kids because they just simply don't want to see them killed. They just don't want to see them murdered. And it's one thing to, to go through the journey of having your child murdered, but it's another one when the person is not held accountable. You feel like, you know, I've lost twice. I've lost my child, and then I lost the, the case by not having the person held accountable. So it, it hurts even more deeper for the families. Um, 